uh, welcome everybody. Um, we've been working, you know, quite a bit on putting this together. Um, the, when I uh, joined the foundation, something like um, one and a half years ago, um, I was probably uh, one of the persons that was involved in, in, in many initiatives already in open data in, in my country, Spain, doing something like six, seven initiatives for different levels of government, and seeing how open data started to be used in my country, and I was identifying, you know, a number of issues coming up. Uh, not only there, but also in initiatives like in the UK, in the US, and others. Um, one of the things that, that I learned also when I joined the foundation is that uh, the global south is very, very different. Um, I saw some people trying to do some sort of transplant of initiatives from the Western world to the global south, and that not working very well. Um, and I started to be quite concerned about that. Um, we started to discuss a little bit uh, with IPRC how we could you know, get an idea on whether or not uh, open data should be done in the global south and how it should be done. How the importance of context there could be something that should be put at the forefront of any single open data for there. Um, and how we could measure what we call the emerging impact in this project, as you know. So I'm so glad that finally we are having this meeting here to discuss about that. And we will be discussing you know, some of our ideas that we intend to put forward in um, the, the, the project. And, um, we, we would love to hear your, your comments and suggestions about that. Thank you. So, so again, uh, this panel is taking place this morning as part of this broader uh, research initiative on the data. And Tim, if you can tell us a bit more about it. I'll try and take very, very briefly through some of the journey so far. Some of the people in this room have been uh, joining us on that summit to your first encounter. So that journey so far started with, as has been said, this recognition that there were open data initiatives cropping up across the world, both government-led initiatives of those 30 or so uh, that Felipe mentioned, but also many civil society-led initiatives. And through this program, uh, already we've discovered all sorts of open data action using data for governance that's not necessarily conceived of as an open government data initiative, but that's got a lot to teach us. So with that recognition that this was an emerging area, uh, uh, a number of the people who are here met in Brasilia alongside the first open government partnership meeting and started mapping out what's being said about open data, what are the potential impacts that are being claimed, and we see many, many potential impacts of open data, whether it's transparency and accountability, economic growth, improving policy, improving environmental sustainability, a whole range of areas where people are seeing potential, yet we've also got very big um, gaps in our knowledge in actually understanding what are the feedback mechanisms that, that lead from data uh, to policy change, who are the beneficiaries and how are the benefits of open data distributed, is there a trickle down benefit or is it uh, accumulated perhaps empowering the already empowered how does open data interact with existing policy agendas around right to information? So we came up with this whole set of areas where we had gaps in our knowledge, and we ended that uh, day-long workshop with a sense of some of the research uh, areas and challenges that, that, that we need to explore. And what we've then done since that workshop is try to develop a, a bit of a framework to think about how we can study emerging impacts of open data uh, in the South, and, and the first iteration of that had these three parts to it saying there are many kinds of open data. There's data from and about governments, the classic open government data. There's also data about companies and markets, perhaps in the targeted transparency companies where governments say companies must release data or companies proactively choose to release data. And then there's data about citizens, both in aggregate statistics that governments and other institutions collect, and perhaps clouding open data a bit. Some of the um, smart disclosure or my data work that people have got direct access to their own data. We've then got different domains of governance, political, uh, economic and social uh, domains into which that data feeds and, and fits each with their own dynamics. And then we've got this range of different emerging outcomes from transparency and accountability, uh, innovation and economic growth, and inclusion and empowerment. And, and could be many more categories, but those were the ones we tried to work with to say, we want to look and find case studies that can illuminate how does open data have an emerging impact in each of these spaces. So uh, around June time, I think, late June, uh, at the uh, World Bank's International Open Government Data Conference, we launched a call for proposals asking projects in the South to uh, propose case study research, quite localised case study research into how data was being used in practice in governance settings. So we'll shift from what's happening on the supply side to what's happening uh, on that use side as well. 
uh, and we were expecting maybe 20 or so. Uh, we got 83 different proposals from 30 uh, different countries. That's just a quick heat map of those. And all those proposals are here in this <laughs> box. Uh, our panel who are staying after lunch are going to have to get that down to 15 or so that will be uh, shortlisted for funding and resourcing. Um, but this fits into this broader open data research network. So the emerging impacts of open data in the South is a focused funded piece of work we're hoping to take forward. Um, but we also recognise that it, it's got to link up with a whole range of other open data research going on and that's where I think we then start our workshop of saying what are these key perspectives for open data research, um, both in the, the Global South but also more broadly that we need to be connecting with and our goal by lunchtime is to have made all the connections we need. Got a really <laughs> Okay, Thanks a lot, Tim. Okay, so um, back to the panel. Now we're running short on time. Um, <laughs> Already? <laughs> yeah. Well, we're Despite of all our efforts. Yeah. And we have until 10:30, which leaves us uh, about an hour uh, for the panel. We'll spend about 30 minutes or so with the uh, members of the panel. We'll have two uh, presenters and two discussants. Um, and that will leave us about other 30 minutes for the floor and comments and, and questions. Again, the, this panel is titled Open Data Impact, Identifying Key Perspectives in Open Data Research. The big aim of the panel is about highlighting which of the dynamics within the supply side and the demand side of open data that matter for potential outcomes and potential impact. So I would just like to um, Introduce uh, Susan, who will be the, the queen of this panel, and she uh, is in charge not only to help us stick on time, but also get the best of your comments and questions um, for the last 30 minutes. So, Susan. Okay, terrific. So, as our pulses are racing with the interest and excitement of this session, which really, it really is dramatic, uh, that we've now heard what's happened so, so to date, and now we're going to get a set of critical perspectives, a uh, way of looking, a set of frameworks that will help the people working on these proposals to clump them together, to question them, to uh, have a really acute sensibility as they approach them. I've asked my beloved colleague Archon Fung to speak first. He's uh, a professor at the Kennedy School who's written and thought uh, deeply about uh, civic participation um, uh, in, and democracy as a subject, which is a pretty big subject, uh, and uh, also not as well known to me, but uh, also well liked, David Eaves who uh, is a Canadian um, guru, we like to call him, of open data, uh, and who recently uh, visited my class where the students were so enthusiastic they're still talking about it. So, I, so we'll begin with Archon uh, for about uh, 10 minutes, and I will nudge you when we get close, and then David, and then uh, Yokai and I will respond. I'll introduce us after that. Go ahead, Archon. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, everyone, and especially to the organizers, Felipe and others, for uh, inviting me. Um, I'll speak quickly because I want to uh, present some provocative kind of uh, questions and frameworks for you. I spent a lot of years at MIT um, as a graduate student and undergraduate, and one of the things we used to say there is science is not neutral. And this was addressed to a bunch of people who thought, well, you know, the production of knowledge and engineering, it's good no matter what. And so we're just going to do it, do it, do it. And then pretty soon you have, you know, undergraduates and professors working on fuel air explosives and chemical weapons. And, in an earlier stage, cluster bombs. And I just want to really make sure that the open data movement doesn't go that way, right? We think openness is great, right? But I want to say data are not neutral and present some comments to uh, get you to think about uh, what exactly, how exactly it's uh, not neutral. Um, the first question is the scope of data and data about whom, right? And this goes to Tim's figure about uh, who's disclosing data. Is it citizens? Is it government? Is it corporation? Or is it corporations? And the, that question is always answered by the demand side and the politics of who's demanding data. Now, we usually think of demand as the users of data, right? And we'll talk a lot about that. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. A lot, a lot of people will talk about who's using data. Um, as the demand side, but there's another demand side. There's a political demand for who is demanding what kinds of data, right? And one, uh, the open government movement was produced in part uh, by 
uh, some people in this room who are constitute part of the political demand for more data from uh, government, or at least uh, uh, data that government holds. And so I think it's important to think about that demand side and what you and other people are asking for, what kinds of data you're demanding and asking for as one dimension, one important and overlooked dimension of demand. Okay, so what data should we demand? So far, I think, of those categories of who's being made transparent, 90% of the data are data about government. And that's what we call the open government movement. I like to call it the naked government movement as a polemical move, right? Um, the naked government has three principles, right? Open uh, data publicity, not secrecy is the default. Information is provided digitally. And that the focus is uh, largely on the government and not uh, the private sector. Now. One question put, in, again, in a highly polemical way, is open government the cluster bomb of our time? Naked government, right? And so the question here is, does naked government make people cynical about the state? Which would be very ironic, because the state is the only apparatus with the power and authority large enough to get us the data in the first place. So if the very data that we're demanding undermine the legitimacy and authority of that institution, that can provide the data, then open government kind of spirals is in a self-destructive way, right? Um, I think that I don't know whether open government or naked government makes people cynical about government. I think that uh, there are good reasons to think that it might, right? So transparency as inform is right now mostly information for accountability, right? It's not information to register when government is doing a good job. It's mostly information to register when government is doing a bad job. The, uh, as a result, this, uh, not as a result, but this data flows into many publics in the developing world and certainly in the United States that are already cynical about government and a journalistic environment that sells stories by catching government doing something wrong, right? You can't sell a newspaper by saying government did something good. That, Sorry, just that dog doesn't bite, as they say. So um, the news, what counts as news, is news about state failure. And so open government feeds, potentially, this cycle of delegitimation of government. So that's one way in which I think uh, many progressives, including the Obama administration, are making a mistake by treating the open government movement as data about government for accountability. I think it just works at... Uh, uh, purposes cross to the purposes of a uh, political view in which government is capable and can do some good stuff. I think it feeds the cynicism that is already a big problem. Okay, so that's the downside. Uh, another dimension of this is that there is a mismatch, right? In an ideal society of information, the information that people would, ha would have would be proportionate to the risks that they face, okay? Now, if you're living in an authoritarian society, I think probably most of the risks to you do come from the state. In a capitalist democracy, I think a large part of the risks that most citizens face come from private entities, from corporations. And yet, there is a mismatch in our expectations, right? The threat to citizens, I think, from the government, at least in capitalist democracies, is pretty low on a bunch of issues that people care about, but the expectation on government up to be transparent is very, very high. Conversely, a lot of threats to citizens, like the mortgage meltdown, or whether your spinach is uh, infested with E. coli, or whether your uh, car crashes because the brakes don't stop, is relatively high. Corporations create a lot of risk to citizens in a lot of different respects. And yet, the transparency expectation on those entities is fairly low. So there's a mismatch, right? The political demand is mismatch. Okay. Okay, so I just draw a bar under that point, and I'll move uh, to a second point here, a second question is, when does transparency have consequences? And this is, I take it, the point of the call for proposals that you guys did to call for, to, to look at uh, the impacts of different kinds of open data efforts, okay? Now, uh, it wasn't so long ago, I think, that uh, people had an implicit presumption that data, once it was open, would almost always produce some kind of salutary impact, or at least anyway, that was the motive, right? That you'd get transparent, if you could only get transparency and openness, you'd get accountability or improved services or whatever it is. I think now uh, many people are beginning to question that. 
uh, automatic connection, and I think that's very good because the automatic connection is, is incorrect. One way to think about it in the area of uh, at least development, um, developing countries and transparency, and even developed countries and transparency, where that transparency is meant to produce accountability, is that there, you can think of an accountability funnel, right? So there's a lot of data sets that open government and open data makes transparent. Some subset of those data sets actually spur or manage to engage people in participation. Many of those data sets nobody cares about, nobody ever uses, right? So that's why that second circle is smaller than the first circle. Only, only a few of them actually manage to interest people. And fewer still, I think uh, sometimes a minuscule subset, actually result in some concrete impact like accountability. So I think there's a funnel here. And the interesting research question is, what is the shape of that funnel? How sharp is that gradient? I think that gradient is very, very, very sharp, right? And then what are the factors that explain the drop-off? Why is it that only a fraction of all the data sets that are out there manage to engage people, and only a small fraction of those result in some desired impact on the organizations that are becoming transparent, right? I think that is probably the critical, or certainly a critical research question in this field. Um, two minutes, okay, great. We have a, a framework for thinking about that a little bit that we presented in full disclosure, and I won't go through the whole thing, but the idea is that information, in order to have impact, has to flow through what we call an action cycle. It has to be information that is salient to people's values, that's accessible to them, that actually results in, a, uh, actually informs a choice that they actually have, and that the users, the actions of the users, redound on the large organizations whose behavior is, is being meant to be changed by open data in a salutary way. Uh, Anybody who's heard me talk, I always talk about the LA restaurant report card example, which is a very simple transparency effort that's very, very effective. Every restaurant in LA has to post a letter grade on its front door, A, B, or C, that is the reflection of its health and safety inspection, most recent health and safety inspection. This is a very elegant, very effective transparency system. It's interesting to think about why this one works when so many others go bust. Okay, so last, very last question is, who uses the data? I think one, again, it wasn't so long ago that most people uh, in thinking about this kind of had this implicit assumption that the main users of the data were ordinary individuals at the end of the day. Um, I think for a lot of uh, kinds of open data, that's just not the case, right? Even President Obama, when he was unveiling the recovery, reinvestment and recovery transparency system, recovery.gov, sketched this picture in which there would be millions of armchair analysts looking at the recovery.gov. That's ridiculous, right? To imagine that Joe Sixpack is going to come home from work and then boot up Stata on his computer and download a 100 megabyte data set and crank through it. It's just like not plausible. He's going to have a beer instead, right? Um, and, 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 and indeed, that turned out to be the case. People who are going to recovery.gov, ordinary people, most of them went because they were looking to, for a job. Right? But that's not the purpose of the job. The site. the site isn't supposed to help you get a job. So it's interesting to think about <clears throat> who the most likely users of different kinds of open data sets are. And um, this is a hypothesis here. The hypothesis is that when you're making something about private data, uh, private goods transparent, like uh, restaurant consumption, then you have a shot at an individual, individuals being the prime users of that data. But when the transparency system, when the data sets are meant to affect some public goods like accountability, corruption, or externalities, the chances of engaging ordinary individuals in the use of that data are minuscule. To the extent that individuals are, to the extent that there are users of those data, they are advocacy groups, media, art organizations, and so on. And you should design the data sets and the access of those data sets and the policy around those data accordingly. Don't expect ordinary individuals to be the prime users of those data. They won't be. Expect professional organizations to be the main users of those data. Here ended the lesson. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a privilege to have David Eves here, who's a negotiation expert as well as an open data uh, advisor to governments.
So, David, your critical perspectives on the research agenda. Yeah. So, um, I was asked to kind of, well, there's two things. One is, uh, I have no business being on this panel. It's, it's fun, gentlemen. It makes me nervous to, uh, to even be here sitting next to them <laughs> since, uh, doubly so, since I just took a red eye from San Francisco where I was, <laughs> I, was uh, I was emceeing the Code for America Summit and foolishly agreed to let Aaron Rodenbach, who's the founder of Statement, take me out for a cigar and two glasses of wine before getting on my plane. It's a more fragile state than I might normally be. Um, but I was also going to look at the supply side of open data and, kind of, and what it might mean. And so what I wanted to kind of do is imagine a world where kind of open data has won. So, you know, like everybody agrees that they should be doing it. It's out there. Everybody has open data portals. And I think we've already begun to see some of the nice things that can start to happen around this. So uh, some, of the, some of the efforts around smart disclosure, which Arkan talked about, so things like restaurant inspection results, um, I'd love to see them not just on the front doors of restaurants, but also embedded into Yelp, into Google Maps, and to Urban Spoon. Because we, you know, as Arkham has chronicled, when we know that when people see this data before they make a decision, uh, they're much more likely to go to restaurants that have better results, and that actually has a big impact on healthcare costs, to say nothing of probably productivity. Um, and we have also already seen kind of the use of data by organizations, especially if it, particularly in the private sector, in ways that I think are generally quite positive, the use of census data to figure out how to like, you know, more efficiently place stores, um, and kind of like, I think, enhance and make the economy more productive. In fact, when I was a tiny, tiny, tiny kid, when I was in elementary school, my best friend's father used to take the Canadian census data and digitize it and integrate it into maps and then sell that to companies so that they could figure out where they should be putting their stores. And so I remember hearing like, you know, no McDonald's was placed in Canada until the census data had been looked at to figure out, you know, where they could target it. And you think back 30 years ago, the companies that had access to that type of information were only the very wealthiest. Whereas today, the people who can access census data, it's a much, much broader group of people. And so NGOs now are more likely to use census data than they would have been 30 years ago when it would have been prohibitively expensive for them to do so. So I think that is kind of a place that is, you know, we have started to move in a good direction. And then finally, when you look at actually the most downloaded data sets on um, data.gc.ca, one of them is the Woodland Caribou rowing ranges, which actually is very close to my heart because I worked as the negotiation advisor to the environmental group caucus. This is 12 environmental groups that negotiated with FPAC, which is the Forest Products Association of Canada, over how to manage the boreal forest. Um, because they were so tired of governments pitting them against each other, they said, why don't we just get into a room and see if the environmentals and the industry can figure out how we should be doing this. And woodland carib caribou turns out to be the marker species by which you assess whether or not uh, you have over you've overlogged an area of boreal forest. And so that actually, that data set serves as a really core and important basis for a negotiation that I think has done a great deal to advance uh, the interest of in preserving the boreal, the boreal forest uh, in Canada and uh, has actually global in, uh, significance. So I think those are kind of some early indications of things that have gone right, but, but here's the danger, and I, and I actually first talked about this three or four years ago, which is that I think there's a group of people out there that Arkham is, is worried about as well, of kind of data utopians, who believe that kind of once we get all the data, and once we have it all out there, the big algorithm in the sky is going to allow us to figure out how we can most perfectly manage our society, and because we'll all have the exact same data to look from, the decisions will all become easy because as rational actors, we'll all obviously agree on what the right outcome should be as a result. And so like, there'll be no more politics because the, uh, the, answer, the answers to all of our problems will be very, very obvious. And I think that would be a horrible, horrible, horrible mistake to make. Um, governments uh, have always, and, and private organizations always, have always treated data as an enormously political piece of kind of infrastructure or uh, commodity or asset. Um, when we kind of look around, going back in time, you will kind of look at around the history of data, and even something as simple as the US census data, I mean, there's huge battles in this country about whether or not you have to go physically count somebody or whether you can use a model to more accurately generate a view of how many people live in a given city or in a given neighborhood or in a given state. And this has real implications because uh, it has implications around what the size of a Congress, uh, what, the, you know, what the area of a Congress, we call them ridings, but uh, you know, like, what, a, what a riding is for an electoral area. Um, and $400 billion in US federal money gets allocated depending on population rates. And so when you don't count all the people in your particular area, 
Uh, that has real implications for how much money you get from the federal government. And it turns out that uh, two censuses ago, it's roughly estimated that about 8 million African American, and minority Americans, and urban living Americans were simply not counted because they couldn't actually go and physically get them. And it turns out that um, 4 million largely white suburban Americans are actually double counted. <laughs> so uh, we treat, so this is a great example, but I think is a very political data set. Uh, and the battle over how it gets collected is one that's actually very, it's fiercely fought in Congress. In fact, it's so fierce it actually doesn't end up going to the Supreme Court. And that's just not the only example. Um, uh, you think of things like local crime data. I mean, I've talked a little bit about there's a, there's in Chicago, outside of Chicago and in Illinois, uh, there's this real look at like crime data and who's getting arrested, who not, who's not getting arrested. Obviously, African Americans getting disproportionately arrested. But the piece of data you don't get is actually the most common uh, reason for arrest is jaywalking. And then the additional piece of data you don't get is that they're actually often living in communities that don't have sidewalks. So it's very easy to arrest people when there's no sidewalk for them to be walking on for jaywalking. And of course, that local context gets lost. And even something even more simple than that, you know, I was just talking yesterday actually to Eric, he was complaining about all the, the fire trucks that go around. So the numbers of fires that have, been, that have occurred in most major cities in North America have been in sharp decline as you know, uh, sprinkler standards have been installed. But of course, the debate around you know, how much we should pay firemen uh, has not gone away. And firemen keep finding new ways for them to become useful. And one of the core data sets that firemen like to use to talk about how useful they are is how many sorties they make. So you'll notice now that firemen actually make way more sorties for car accidents, for medical emergencies, all sorts of things that you probably actually don't need the firemen to be there for. And there's probably much cheaper ways to deliver that service. But because what we measure is how many sorties they make, that becomes the focus of the conversation. And of course, they are very incented to make as many sorties as they possibly can. Um, and then, uh, you know, when I think about the global stuff, I was actually thinking of you, because Chile recently, uh, their government was kind of, if you will, quote unquote, busted uh, for a, uh, suddenly producing a census that undercounted people, because now it makes it look like the GDP per capita is a whole lot better. <laughs> and have also been tinkering with, uh, with the, um, the notion of what the unemployment rate is to show that they've actually been achieving their objectives. And they're not the only ones. I mean, Argentina is, I think, actually the kind of the case point of the moment of a government that's literally going in and not just kind of tinkering with the data in a kind of a political sense, but actually just going in and actually rewriting the data so that it fits a political narrative that they have. In fact, it's such an extreme case. I had a friend who works for the World Bank who tried to tweet at one point. He said, uh, yeah, I wonder how real this, that data from, the world, from Argentina is. And he actually got an immediate call from the World Bank saying he had to delete that tweet because if someone from the World, world Bank says that Argentina is making up their data actually has very real implications for whether or not they're allowed to secure further loans from the IMF and from the World Bank. So no official figure is allowed to do that. No official person is allowed to do that. But there is like that's like it shows you everybody knows that it's going on, but people actually are very reluctant to talk about it because it has bigger implications. And even sadly, my own country in Canada, data has become enormously political uh, because our government didn't cancel the long form census, which is the kind of longer form of the census that six, one in every six people get, but they made it voluntary, which was functionally destroying it. And the main reason I believe that they did this, since they actually spent more money to do it than to actually run it in a normal sense, is that they actually wanted to eliminate the collection of this data. Because if you simply don't collect the data, then you don't have to know that there's a problem which means you don't actually have to build a social policy to fix it. So one of the big things I kind of think that open data is making us realize is as it becomes more open and as we gain more access to it, it's forcing us to realize that data is not just political today, but data has always been political. And that what's not going to happen is the big algorithm in the sky and the world of perfect, you know, the world of kind of perfect debate where we're suddenly going to agree on everything. What's going to happen is the conversation is going to get pushed down the stack and we're going to have politicians fighting over what type of data they should be collecting because they know it's going to end up in the hands of the public, regardless of whether it's open now or not because of FOIA. And so they're going to get very controlling and very concerned about what's going to happen there. I, sorry, one more thing I want to say. Um, the, the, second, the, the last part I wanted to make is I'm, becoming, I'm reading, if you haven't read Seeing Like the State, I cannot recommend this book enough. You should definitely go pick up Seeing Like the State. And I think there's actually a Seeing Like the State versus Seeing the State debate that I think open data is going to generate. That when you look at why the state first started to generate data, it was, of course, to try to control citizenry. Uh, we all have last names because you are all, frankly, data points that the state wanted to track, and only tracking you by first names was too difficult. So the state actually forced us all to create last names, so we would all be much more trackable so it could figure out how to tax us. The same with cadastral maps, uh, like all these things, and also the state could manage its assets more effectively. Um, what I think is interesting 
is when we start doing more open data, especially if we're able to standardize that data across, da across jurisdictions, um, the question we have to ask ourselves is, yes, the, the state is better, better able to manage these assets, but maybe we are now better able to manage the state. Because we actually, just like it made us more visible by creating data sets about us, but as we create data sets about the state, maybe we make it more manageable. And I don't say that in kind of a utopian sense in that I think like, you know, we're gonna control the state. I do actually hope that there's some positive benefits from that, that it gives us kind of a, a counterweight to the power of the state. But I think it also raises real questions around who's going to control that counterweight and who's gonna have the ability to influence it. So when we make the state more visible and when we can control the state more effectively, who actually ends up benefiting, benefiting from that? So I kind of like, and, and then ultimately, will the state revolt, just like our history is filled with people who revolt being kind of like, having a census down on them, having being measured by the state, will the state itself revolt to being me measured by us? And so those are the kind of, for me, some like interesting research questions that I think, uh, or at least some interesting ideas that I hope influence some of the research questions that are going on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. I asked uh, Yokai Benkler, well known for his uh, deep thinking on the wealth of networks, and someone who I think we should all get into the open government research world. Uh, so part of this is co-opting Yokai to, to drag him into this. Frame. So, Yoka, your comments here. So, Susan kindly uh, prefaced by the fact that I'm uh, ignorant uh, uh, of what goes on, but uh, I, I thought before you spoke that I would be the one with the cold water, although I shouldn't have, having listened to Archon before, and I should preface by saying that a lot of what I learned, I learned from listening and, and reading to Archon and, and, and listening and, and reading Jennifer's work uh, uh, on her uh, dissertation over the last few years uh, when she was doing her doctorate. Um, so I don't want to repeat the same cold water. I just want to identify a couple of particular points. Um, the first one is uh, just to repeat. There's a lot of hype and a lot of misunderstanding, and it has to be very careful. The second one, which is implicit in both of the prior presentations, but I think needs to be crystallized, you cannot understand data independent of the institutional and organizational configuration of power. Um, so the debate about the census, it's not only Canada. We stopped collecting in our census questions uh, in our economic census questions about internet access when it turned out the data were showing that we had gone the wrong way in selling out to uh, uh, the major incumbents. So we just stopped collecting the data that would otherwise have gone to the OECD to show our decline. Uh, and then, lo and behold, you switched administrations and you start arguing about what data to collect. So, but the critical point, and this is, again, if I remember and I think about the IDRC meeting a couple of years ago here on a second decadal review of the ICT4D uh, uh, program. It's the question of how to focus specifically on the problems of the South. And institutional capacity to produce, structure, and distribute data is technically complex, politically sensitive, and trivially susceptible to manipulation in such a way that a naive investment in open data could be trivially. Um, uh, so here, let me just channel Jennifer a little bit on recovery.gov, because I can't sit at the table and hear someone say, you can't have individuals produce sophisticated data, because Joe Sixpack won't run Stata without saying, I can't sit here and not say Wikipedia, Linux, etc. That's just no longer a viable statement. To say you can't, you can't find clusters within the population that can act on decentralized models. But recovery.gov has another problem, which is the structure of the data is not amenable to actual transparency. You don't know what's behind the $1.6 million grant in this particular place. It's about getting agencies to describe in usable categories what it is that's happening. And so that's an institutional capacity at one level. And at another level, it's institutional buy-in to actually make themselves transparent. There are ways of describing the data in a way that makes them uh, machine processable in, in a way that's really comparable. And there are ways of basically obfuscation. So I can say that $1.6 million was spent down the street on a contract. 
but I don't know what it is and what it's for. I don't think the limit, the, the efficient limit there is the fact that you can't find a thousand sophisticated grad students who would be really excited about doing this and you need an organization, the organizations are important. I think the problem is getting governments to actually describe the data in ways that are in fact usable by said thousand grad students. And we've learned that lesson in the last decade plus from free software uh, and on. Um, but that has a particular lesson for investment in the global south because both the technical capabilities the uh, 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 civil service culture, the commitment to doing it is highly variable from place to place. And I'd say if there's one thing, given that I need to make a, a very uh, short statement, if there's one thing to say is to understand that there's a, a, a country by country, sometimes even region by region analysis that needs to be done about what is feasible and not in terms of open data. If, for example, the government is not particularly uh, well-functioning, but there's a very vibrant group of techies who are engaged in free software development or uh, uh, statisticians, or there's a strong expat community that is going to be willing to do this, and you can use a particular kind of open data model to harness those people to work around a non-functional government, that may be a strategic intervention. More likely than not, building capacity within the government to say what we need to do is to standardize food safety standards and put them out there on a label that's a very low tech sort of here's what you have here or there. The ABC model is more a model of built institutional capacity within government and a good civil service structure, it is decidedly not an open, not decidedly not. I would push back on the idea that it's an open data approach. It's a invest not in open data models, but in well-functioning civil service models of producing standardized uh, reporting requirements from companies and translation, easy interface translations to, 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 to users. I would not track that as an open government. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure, at least. Um, but, but particularly, again, from the perspective of investment in the global south, it's always a trade-off between investment in internal governmental institutional capacity versus finding hacks, ways where you can peel off data in a way that is relatively easy to do in a usable form, not something that can easily be dodged by the government it, by, by lumping it in all sorts of ways. So caribou movement is that kind of an example in the sense that it seems apolitical. You might actually get a professional who's doing this in a particular place without understanding the political implications that then creates a political flow to solve a particular problem. But I think the investment needs to be much more strategic and local and by strategic, I actually probably mean tactical uh, uh, and local and, and defined for the local and always in opposition to if I put this money in open data relative to if I put this money in building internal capacity and norms for uh, uh, disclosure and extraction from companies. And I completely agree on the question of using the government as a counterbalance to private uh, uh, power, but I also think that governments are dangerous too. I put it at high, high, uh, and high, low, rather than at high, low. Um, um, uh, the, that's it. Fantastic. I have a few words for us coming from the perspective of someone who recently served in government. I, I suspect that several of you have. As we look at the open government movement around the world, and I was one who was quite excited about the potential of the open government partnership. Um, it has struck me over the last year that it has a deep potential to be the study of bright, shiny objects, at least from the developed country point of view. That look, looking for stories that seem to indicate that change might happen and then celebrating them out of perspective, out of proportion to what they actually accomplished. And if, if I were looking to devote uh, resources to a research agenda, I would be very concerned about um, finding ways to visualize this complex system, which is what we're talking about. Lots and lots of input, a lot of data swirling around institutions, building capacity, feedback loops that are rich or not, 
emergent uh, reactions that occur or don't. We only make progress when those things are visible. And government only responds to pressure from the outside that is uh, so persuasive that it cannot be denied. So their, their own permeable membrane has to adjust. Right now, my perception is that government may be using the open data movement in some countries as a form of elite avoidance of uh, some of the most difficult problems that their societies face. So grinding poverty, growing inequality, these are the questions that government should be confronting. And by just releasing data, we haven't solved those problems. So I would be very interested in an agenda that looked at visible policy impacts. What happens to the allocation of resources if individuals are actually able to participate in budgeting, in making strategic decisions about what priorities of government should be? What, what's visible about policy change? So far, I've seen very little research on that point. And it troubles me, because uh, governments will never react if they don't, don't see real change. Is so second research question from my perspective is, is public participation in policy making effective, or are the same five people in a smoke-filled room still making all the key decisions? Is it actually possible to get slivers of attention from people about difficult policy areas because of what technology makes possible, get their attention, get their input, and have them both feel a safe sense of agency, which is what we hope for from the open government movement, and a real reaction from the government inside. And a third point I'd love to see work on is, does government actually change internally in response to all of this? Because the Obama administration made a lot of claims here in America about the po power of the open government movement, but then kept behind its walls its structures entirely intact, where it's still almost impossible to get anything done. And uh, there's a lot of mid-level civil servant resistance to uh, genuine change, an innovative culture, whatever you want to call it. So if I were king and uh, structuring the research agenda, given all of these imponderables, as Archon points out, who's actually using the data, you know, David says quite rightly, it's all political. My contribution here is to say, and the system only changes if research makes things visible that weren't apparent before and that that visibility creates real pressure on government to change and enrich its approach to democracy. But my real role here is to get the rest of you talking. That's because I, I know we're seething with thoughts. Out there. It's been, uh, and I, what, what's the most important thing that we can say right now to help structure the brains of the people who are going to be allocating these research grants? What's the most important thing? Michael. Uh. Yeah, um, <laughs> I want to challenge, I think, what Archon and David said. I've I, I just spent six, almost two months um, in, in Africa, in Central Africa, working with governments, and not with donors, but with governments and with uh, various organizations that are working with governments. And uh, I don't recognize, from what Archon said and what David said, the reality of what I saw there. I mean, what I see is that the, the model of government that they're presenting is that government is either uh, it's either the uh, capitalist government or it's the authoritarian government. I think there has to be a mo an, inter an interim model, which is that government is positive, that government is a contributor to the social good, that government can be seen as a partner, as a necessary partner, as part of a broad, uh, framework of development, and, uh, and I saw some very hopeful signs of that. And uh, the issue that I see is that uh, data is one element of that, and I, I really appreciate what Yokai said because uh, it, data contributes to this process. Uh, it's possible to strengthen these processes by focusing on and investing in effective means for developing uh, for developing data. Uh, focusing on openness or non-openness is really almost irrelevant in those issues. It's really a question of building capacity. And uh, if the framework is one that is effective and developing, then the issue of openness should be part of that process. And 
It's a multi, these are multi-stakeholder process and should be part of this process. And um, so I think that I think that it's very, very I think it's not appropriate to be thinking simply about government in terms of transparency, in terms of that data is only about transparency and accountability and so on. Data is also about development, also about supporting development. And, uh, and I think that that's the challenge that we have here, as to how to see how open data or data, da open data as an element of data, uh, as an element of the building of the internal capacity to develop and manage data, uh, is, a, is a tool of development. And so it's not a question of, of simply seeing you know, uh, data as a as a as a, as a as a as a basis for advocacy. It's a basis for effective planning, right. for program development, for evaluation, for empowering various segments of the society. And I think that that has to be underlying our research, what we need kind of pursue and, and see as our research direction. Because I think otherwise, I think that, that we're, we're opting for the for the for the world of the develop of a developed world approach to, to, to data as opposed to I think is what should be our, our direction, which is a, a, a global south approach or whatever. So thanks. That's fascinating. Yes, Pete. I just want to pick up on uh, what uh, Mike uh, has said because it's relevant to my dissertation that I'm about to defend next month. <laughs> I spent a year, a uh, few years ago in South Africa, uh, mainly doing what Michael was describing. My interest was how government data and information is being used to tackle those uh, development problems in South Africa, from food security to HIV AIDS, all kinds of uh, problems. And uh, what happened is that uh, in this regard, when I look at that as uh, a tool for development, I focus on the way that it helps them generate knowledge yeah. that feeds back to the government. And this is how I demonstrated the value of this information instead of saying, you know, I measured the value. I couldn't measure any value. Nobody could tell me exactly what was, you know, the value of information. But when I came across, for example, the education roadmap document that the Development Bank of Southern Africa developed, when I asked them the question, what was your use of government data, they said this was our main source. And it had all sorts of uh, problems, but now the government is using it actually you know, to go back to education plan. So this is about something. The other thing is that, it, you know, that uh, uh, donors and, you know, organizations in Africa, they have limited budgets. They need to prioritize their funding. Also, they use this data. They get the data, they claim it, they come up with decisions, and they will say, you know what, this is where we will put the million dollars. This is where it, what is needed. So I would like to emphasize this point. And if I look at the framework, and this was the point I wanted to add, is that, if you look at, uh, let me just uh, see it here, here on my computer. Oh, you can uh, it here. Ask. It's okay. Uh, it's here. Yeah. So if you look at uh, the emerging outcomes of it, I didn't really see any mention of the value of this information and data to generate knowledge in these countries. Mm -hmm. That can be used, actually, academic and policy knowledge. This is very important. Just remember, they have a problem, like in South Africa, where I was there. Almost every single report that I studied, which was like 12 of them, mainly relied on this, and now it's being used in different uh, contexts. The last thing that I would like to add uh, is that having lived in developing countries and worked in South Africa for some time, uh, I would like to emphasize uh, the historical element you know, of those countries. And we have to realize that in addition to all the issues that uh, David and Artem uh, mentioned about the US or the OECD, there's a, a, an issue of like what is the concept of openness in these countries sometimes is not really clear to almost everybody there, even those who claim that they know. You know, openness is an attitude. Openness is like a concept in your mind that you live it. I've lived in, in North America for eight years and I do this for like living and work. And, but because I was born in a country where openness wasn't really that attitude, I still struggle sometimes, right? The academic ride is different from the real ride when I think about it. So keep this in mind, and this should help us to have realistic expectations of what we can get, what we can get from this research. Mm -hmm. So this is the point I would like to emphasize. I'll just leave the floor for others, and I'll come back with some other specific uh, comments. Tim? I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come to this. So I think, um, struck by two points. One is, is, is the framing we've got here around governance rather than governments, and recognizing mm -hmm. particularly 
about the role of donors, the role of all sorts of different players in different countries from private sector, public sector, national public sector, sort of multilateral institutions. And, and I think this is something we've still got to wrap our heads around is yeah. where the data is coming from, from all these different players and how this is playing out in, in describing, I think one of the things we found hardest was describing government situations and, and working out what's the literature and the work we should be tapping into there that's really exploring how governance has shifted from a sort of government citizen uh, approach to recognising all these different institutions. Um, the other thing I wanted to pick up on was um, uh, a comment actually uh, Michael made a few weeks ago in Helsinki about seeing data as part of a process and a service, not as a stock of stuff. And we so often treat open data as if there is this data set that is a stock of data, rather than recognising um, it, it always needs to be mobilised, put into action, and have a whole range of intermediary services around it. And uh, I'm quite struck by the potential for us to learn from some of the open source world where managing those ecosystems, managing and working out what's a sustainable ecosystem of, of development, what isn't around a piece of software, and what can that teach us about data as well. So I work on the International Aid Transparency Initiative where we are learning by doing and, and making lots of mistakes and how do we make sure not only there's a data set over here but there's all the tools people need to use it how do we let the market provide those civic hackers provide those but how do we then fill the gaps when a civic hacker um, loses their job and so can't spend free time on that anymore and suddenly that could become a key part of our ecosystem and infrastructure and, and suddenly lots of downstream users are, are having problems and, and so on so working out and trying to see this quite complex structure between the data over here and the uses over here and then work out what sort of interventions can make it sustainable is, is I think, uh, another challenge in this space. I find this a fascinating point. So you've got an ecosystem of data um, for many different entities, not just government, not just private citizens, but a, a variety of actors that are trying to move objects on the face of the earth, improve their lives. Uh, what research frameworks, in your view, how people who haven't spoken down there, um, might help us understand the healthiness of that ecosystem better. Yes? We came across recently somebody at Oxford who does ethnographies of policymakers. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of explosion of interest right now in the whole case star or knowledge management dimension. And um, maybe I even studied for IDRC on all the different aspects of knowledge management or research communications. And one of the difficult things is understanding the demand side of the demand side cannot articulate it very clearly because it's a moving target. So we've come across an enormous amount of information or knowledge about, or this, there was just a conference in Hamilton in Ontario called Case Star, knowledge management, knowledge translation. So the entry point relative to this group was not data, but knowledge, which speaks to your point. So I think if there's a lot of ongoing work in fields that are very directly connected to data. Knowledge management as a, um, in fact, I suspect there are fields all over academia that connect to this. You get this hallucinatory sense that everything connects after a while. <laughs> but, oh, you okay, yes. Just, just a small thing, and it's really more a question of how you want to frame your own decisions within the range of grant making. Uh, and this really responds uh, directly, I think, to, to, to Michael and Ryan's uh, yeah. uh, interventions. Um, the idea of knowledge for development, the idea of building capacity for self-measurement for purposes of development is not a new one. It's something that people have been talking about for a long time. Clearly, there's something about the use of open data that is creating a mismatch between, not clearly, at least from this little exchange, it suggests that there's a potential mismatch between what we initially start to talk about when we trigger open data and open government and the core urgent needs of development. So question one is, eh, it's too much work to deal with open government. Uh, let's focus on what we always knew, knowledge for development, data collection for purposes of government planning, etc. That's where the cash value is. The other option is to say, OK, we know that's important. E are there? discrete ways of improving those functionings, including feeding back to the role of corruption in failures of development, uh, that could leverage some of these materials, but then it almost needs a different name. Maybe it's open data for development, maybe it's data for development, maybe some, something that anchors it in 
we're only interested in this small slice of what you guys are worried about over there where you have billions of dollars to invest in this um, and where development in many senses take care, takes care of itself. Uh, tell that to Greece. Um, uh, so I just don't know what the amount of, of grant making and whether you really want to focus specifically on what aspects of this very complex and diverse set of things people are working on under the umbrella of open data could contribute to what we already know for a long time, which is knowledge for development is a really important form of investment, which would be my intuition. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, if we could bring in, yes. Susan, did that relate what he just said to your point, and I was, because I've been mulling it over, when you said you worry a little bit about focus on open data is taking away from some of the other issues of power and inequality and so on. Yeah, my, my great dream is to join these two conversations. So what Michael and Ray are talking about is exactly what I think is important. But Yoka is adding on here that there's a, there's a benefit to bringing in this new work on open government and governance and contributing it to existing work in the developing world that's been going on for a long time. So it's, it's a way of... Uh, and there's actually an ironic translation because yeah. some of the civic hacking that's really about applications when we look at it from the perspective of transparency, seems like a critique. Yes, we say transparency and accountability, and really we're talking about catch the bus. Right. Sort of little, right. si but it's entirely possible that from a development perspective, that's what you want first of all, that people know there are buses and where they can catch them. And you'll deal with transparency 20 years from now. And the thing that's a critique here may be exactly the thing you're trying to harness there. That's very true. So I, I have had the feeling in America that um, we're focusing on some bright, shiny objects and that this deeper agenda is not really being undertaken. If we can join these two worlds, I think there's a lot we can get done. But yes, Rob. So I, I think this conversation is oh, sorry, moving in, 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 a, in an important direction in talking about ecosystems and the direct and the evolution of ecosystems. And I think um, if we're talking about development, poverty, alleviation, a lot of this work is improving the work of institutions and societies. And I'd, I'd like to kind of point for a little bit of comment around between Archon and Yokai, which I think Archon makes the very, very important point that it is organizations that are going to be um, consumers of this organ, of, of this information. And uh, one of the things that I think would be important to look for is how open data might actually contribute to the strengthening or even the formation of civil society organizations. Mm -hmm. And I think Yokai's work is also very, very important in this manner, which is that there are new ways of forming organizations not necessarily in the traditional ways that right. we saw, but that um, there are new ways to form um, digital organizations. No, David has had his hand up. Yeah, come on. I actually don't feel like, I'm not sure what I said that makes you feel like it was in disagreement with anything that you added. I definitely think that Arkham might have said some things. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and this kind of this kind of brings me to like, one of the challenges I'm feeling around open data right now is that I think open data at the moment is making everybody unhappy because it's not, it's not sufficiently meeting any one stakeholder's goals, um, and it's getting appropriated for all sorts of things. So some <laughs> right. people want to use open data for development, other people want to use open data for transparency, other people want to use open data to hold governments to account, um, other people want to use open data for economic development, and I think that actually it has something to do with all of those things, and I don't think it's the pixie dust that's going to make any one of those things right. magically happen, and so uh, we kind of, now people kind of say, well, open data is not going to solve all the transparency problems. They're like, yes, it absolutely isn't. And then it, it kind of the, the, the open data gets critiqued about that and that alone. Um, and, and then someone says, well, you know, it could be useful in development. I'm like, yes, it could be useful in development. But yes, I also agree it's not going to solve everything there uh, either. Um, the one place where I actually think that open data is potentially the most useful and I, and I hope gets into a research agenda somewhere and, and I didn't I only reviewed seven of the projects so I didn't see any of the ones that I looked at but uh, I'm actually I'm most excited about how open data can change government yeah. that uh, you know when I've talked to most of the people who, who operate open data portals um, some of you have heard me talk about this before but uh, the kind of the reoccurring theme tends to be that about 30% of the visitors to an open data portal come from IP addresses within the government that created that open data portal and that suggests to me that maybe uh, the open data is actually enabling 
the government, like that, the, men, the kind of the, the poor end leaders who are inside government, who are desperately trying to get data so they can write a policy that will try to solve a problem, are finally actually able to access data that their own, like their own institution is creating, but they each have to like get like five other managers to sign off on before they have access to. So for kind of breaking down those transaction costs, that's actually I think the, that for me is like one obvious area where I'm hoping that open data has some very interesting things to play. And I'd like to think that it's going to help on the development front because if you architect for open in that way. Uh, it might make it easier for, uh, you know, for for kind of governments to find ways to do development more, much more cheaply than I think we in the West are kind of currently creating public policy. Yes, Jennifer. Uh, so I'd like to make a point. So one, I think it can be important to make better connections between open data and open government or openness in general, because there are other forms of openness in government than data, and uh, technology can be used for textual analysis which reveals even more interesting trends than data itself. So this focus on machine-readable data is very understandable because it's easier to get it and it's clear what we are looking at. But other forms of government decision-making, uh, budget allocations, even newspaper analysis can actually create a much richer picture and um, inform this uh, general open government ecosystem. And then talking about ecosystems, um, as more and more players, in, uh, and it's specifically relevant for development, but as more and more actors release their data, it becomes increasingly important to see how um, budgets flow. So for instance, an institution like the World Bank, they release their data, and then a country like Tanzania releases their data. And then we can see to what extent uh, the data from the World Bank, which is Tanzania, and what happens down the road. So to make these connections, think to, there, there's, here's the place where open data can be really important to, to understand what works and what doesn't work in development because we can mm -hmm. see this flow from an international institution to the uh, street level in, yeah. uh, in a city. And as part of it, it should be very important to measure changes in impact over time, which currently doesn't really happen because you see data is released as uh, one uh, kind of one-time thing, and then uh, it's not necessarily being updated. So if we are looking at impact, that seems to be quite important. I want to pick up on uh, David and, and Jennifer's last interventions here. If, as we're looking for change over time in governance affected by open government, open data, how, what are our suggestions for evaluators of projects about how that could be measured? Is it possible to measure? Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, it always concerns me after having done uh, extensive research about value, information, and knowledge, and et cetera, yeah. to use measure. Because it's very difficult. You know, you have network effects, you have True. other things. It's a complex it, system. It, yeah, right. it's very complex. And even when I was reviewing my proposals, I was thinking only about a way that if this project to be successful in the future, we have to have a, a system that as General said, that over time, we have those like, uh, let's say, indicators or signs that tell us that they are on the right track. I don't want to judge like success or failure in, at this stage. I would like to see improvement in the team. I would like to see the community center in this village is using some of this information, whether you know, it was used efficiently or effectively to like raise $10,000 or not. It's not my concern at this point. Right. Is it getting into the community? Is our understanding about open data increasing? And uh, how do we know that? We have to be more, I would say, qualitative in this and give time to this to emerge. Terrific. I see Tim. I, 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 very big point. I think the other thing we've got to find ways of tracking is unintended consequences and yeah. the things that we're not looking for, and that makes them really hard to find. Yeah. But, but I think really important to be looking at as well. Uh, somebody wasn't. Yes. Yeah, just to pick up on a couple of things that have been said, and then I start with the point Michael made that governments are not inherently bad things or good things. I mean, for the most part, they're positive and they're intendedly good. They're just not very efficient. Yeah. And most of the times, they can't figure out how to get stuff done. Yeah. And, and that's sort of from our perspective, and in that regard, I see open data as a vehicle for engagement. It, it starts a whole bunch of conversations between government and people that have been non-traditional participants in governance, you know, developers and universities who traditionally contributed to policy in a different kind of way, but 
know they are directly engaged. Yeah. Uh, so I, I like to think of open data. I mean, we're having many hats of open data here. But it really is a disruptor. Mm. I think it changes the way that the conversations take place. And it means that it's hard to predict those unintended consequences that uh, Tim said. Right. You almost can't say what will come out at the end of this. But it, it drives a level of engagement between a set of constituents that traditionally have been very detached from each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing that's fascinating about it. And really, it's really how do we harness that right. Uh, right. towards many of these positive outcomes that we're looking for. Very interesting. Michael, I saw you had your hand up. I just want to add, I think, to what Mona said uh, and what you're talking about. One is, I think, from a research perspective, we should be looking at the strategic level as well. Yeah. What are the different strategies? The uh, models of open data use uh, in various environments, what are the effects of that? And yeah. that, that I think is a, be a very useful research uh, activity to see various jurisdictions will be using data and knowledge, open data, in various kinds of ways, and then to assess those in terms of the impact and see which are better, which, are, which aren't. And, um, I mean, one of the interesting things for me. I just did was the way in which the process of reflecting on, in part, on the data was in fact acting in a very positive way to enhance the capacity of the people who were doing it because there was a peer kind of peer effects going on. They were uh, being challenged to think about additional additional uh, uh, areas that they hadn't thought about before. So this was in fact acting in a, in a, in a positive way to do capacity building in the various institutions. And you know that that was not you know wasn't an effect that anyone was expecting. And uh, but I think I think strategically, if you start looking at the various strategies you, and different models, then you can uh, kind of identify ways in which appropriate ways of proceeding, or better ways of proceeding than others. Which picks up deeply on Tim's point that looking at a very local level and qualitatively and looking at things as a system and, and attempting to describe it and then have other people comment on it. Maybe that's the best we can do in, in working in such a system. Yes, sir. On that, I, I don't think it's the best you can do. I think um, people, uh, you, everyone in the, looking at the impact ought to hold themselves to a higher standard in at least sketching out what you think the full chain of causation from the provision of the information to some consequence of that information is, right? And so, you know, think about my funnel. So where I think you suggested is enough is describing the openness of the data and the participation in the use of that data, right? But that never gets you to the third circle. Whether the third circle for you is accountability or economic development or human development or learning, I don't care. But that third circle is really, really important. And understanding means understanding you know, not only that first arrow, causal arrow, about what causes participation and engagement or not, but the second arrow as well about, well, when does that participation and engagement actually do something good in addition to the intrinsic value of participation and engagement, right? And I think the drop-off, as I said, is very steep. Um, and, uh, you know, a second point on the research uh, dimension, it's always helped me to think about math paired cases, to think about more than one, and in particular to think about a loser and a winner. Because that allowed, that imposes a discipline in your own head about, well, what is a loser, right? And if you think, well, everything's a winner, then I don't think you're asking yourself hard enough questions. What is the loser? What is the winner? And then that creates some variation so that you can begin to understand, well, what's causing this thing to lose and this one to win, right? Um, that's the first. The second comment is, um, you know, I take the point about uh, development, and I think you know, I agree with Yokai's response. Open data is a means to a chain of ends, and I think it would be a mistake to fetishize open data and put all of our energy in that. I think it's important to be clear about what your bigger project is, right? And if it's increasing the capacity of the state, open government is a means to that, and some configurations of open government will do that and some will not. If it's about accountability as an, and transparency as an instrument to development because you know that 60% of the school teachers in Tanzania just don't show up every day and so maybe that particular state is not so well intended, it's not just an efficiency problem but a corruption problem, then a certain kind of open data will do that, right? If your project is data to provide private sector actors with additional 
um, uh, means to produce more economic value, then certain open data strategies will do that. But you know, I think it's important to think about the whole chain and your end at, in addition to the means of just open data because they're so related. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, just adding to what Arvin was saying, uh, many of the research starts exactly in the bigger circle of your funnel. I think one way to go would be to focus on the smaller circle of the funnel as a starting point. And I understand from all the comments is that open data is kind of passing the bug from other issues that we really should be focusing on. And perhaps doing open data research, we should bring those back as a core, as a center, as a starter, and burden up basically our concerns, not only think about um, open data for freedom of expression, but open data as a role playing with censorship, or instead of just transparency about secrecy, or instead of just about, about accountability, what's the role of power concentration, and how open data plays out in that, participation of big players, and so on. Basically, just turn the side and focus on the smaller funnel and open the, the, the window to these other issues we have been passing the buck on as a starting point for the research. Last one, Fernando. So just, just a comment, I guess, there are two things. I guess one of the things that I find less useful over time is the distinction between supply and demand in terms of data, because it's really about, uh, if it's an ecosystem that creates data and is much more diverse as you have just said, with the kind of could come from everywhere, basically, and there are different collective ways to generate this data that might, that we usually see this in the developed country that won't be the same in the developing country. So there's an ecosystem that generates the data that more and more internationally. It's not just about one government generating a specific data set. And there are standards that are emerging, pushes that are kind of a technical ecosystem around generating data on a specific, specific domain. So I guess there, this is one of, Things that I, I found it less useful over time just to get one that thinks there's a huge demand inside government for data that comes from, from outside. So it just doesn't make a lot of sense to, to just about the money supply. It's about the ecosystem. But as this ecosystem develops, how this gets into the local governance and the process of decision making and in the process, that's what we try to distinguish a bit on the kind of the open data and all this environment of things that generate data versus the local context, the budgeting and the local level, how the, how the decision is taking place, who is using the data, as I said, it's just kind of, uh, that this has an interaction or not, so that this, this might be good or might be bad, and this might be creating different anomalies in terms of power distribution or empowering different groups and so on, that's the kind of question that we were kind of trying to get and, and, and this kind of leads into some, some uh, emerging outcomes that are positive or bad, I mean, really, I guess, I mean, it's just so. And I, I agree with you that this kind of somehow connects with your side for a while. A lot of data has been started being generated. There is a bit of, I, I just seen a bit of a connection with what you propose in some of the issues that we're trying to, we're trying to look at you. Mm -hmm. uh, see the process of participation or the engagement and use of the data and what's kind of really making in terms of impact at the end of the day. Just trying to, to Connect some of the things that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. With this, with these nuances, the population is to survive the environment. So. Okay, it's impossible to sum up this conversation. <laughs> so I will say it's been extremely interesting and I think does set a number of markers for the uh, discussion for the rest of the day. And I wish you a good conversation and a rich one. Thank you very much. Thank you.